Where the hell is Juan Zarate? <laughs> it will be a boring isn't there, conversation. Isn't that the name of a... Where is Juan Zarate? Yeah. Good to have you. Good to have you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, the bar will stay open, so those that aren't going to be sufficiently educated can always re take their repast back there. But I think you're going to be fixated by a very interesting evening. Uh, I want to say thank you for coming. My name is John Hammer, uh, the president here at CSIS. Uh, and this is probably the last thing we're going to be doing here in this building. We're going to be decamping very quickly. As a matter of fact, there's wreckage around here, if you look to see. We're moving out, moving to our new headquarters. We'll be there in about, well, it's probably 10 days before we're actually going to be there. But, but this is about the last thing we're going to do with you here and want to say, Welcome to all of you. It's not hard to find our new place, and I would hope that you all join us when we get up to 1616 Rhode Island Avenue. It's just four blocks from here. Uh, I want to say thanks to, Ron, uh, to uh, Juan for giving us a chance to host this t tonight. Now, I, thanks, I feel like I'm spending my entire day with Juan because when the alarm went off this morning, <laughs> whose dulcet voice was on NPR, <laughs> but Juan Zarate, you know, and so I figure my whole day is going to be devoted to <laughs> listening to Juan. I think it's, it's uh, but it's emblematic of the significance of the book. The book is really quite good. And you know we frequently talk about whole of government, but what that usually means is I want your budget, and would you please send it to me? You know that's usually what that means when you hear government people talk about whole of government. And um, but what I think we're really going to listen to today is about what re real whole of government means when we brought to bear uh, an, honestly an underutilized. Uh, tool that is available to governments for their national purposes and intents. And Juan's going to describe that to us and discuss that with us today. And was one of the champions, one of the pioneers. I've frequently amassed, is, is Juan a treasury guy or is he a defense guy? I say yes, both. He's been, that's been his personal avocation to help build America in many ways. And he did it very powerfully uh, during his role when he was over at Treasury. So we're going we're to explore that today and listen to it. And of course, who better to bring this to all of us and engage all of you than Rachel Martin? Um, uh, now, I'd, I don't know how this lady does it. I mean, you know, she, her, you know, her husband works in the NSC. She's, she's with uh, NPR with the weekend edition and is as a little one-year-old at home. So she, she, covers, she has terrorism at home, terrorism at work, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, everything. Uh, but uh, but a, remarkable, uh, a remarkable journalist and personality and genuine policy leader. Uh, and, I, and I'm grateful that she's willing to take the time tonight to be with us. I, I mean, I will say, Juan, I don't know how the hell you convinced her to read your book when she should have been <laughs> taking care of her little son. But, but she devoted the time to it, and it's going to make it for a very interesting evening for all of us. So would you, with your applause, please welcome both Rachel and Juan, and we'll get this started. <laughs> Well, Dr. Hamry was half joking, but it is serious when Juan called and said, I've got a favor to ask, <laughs> little book I've written, you know, three, four hundred pages, <laughs> terrorist financing, um, and I said, sure. And I was, and I've said this to his face <laughs> privately, pleasantly surprised at how compelling I found this book to be. It is not exactly a beach read, but as far as the topic is concerned, it is pretty darn close. My wife read it, so I think that's a testament to it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I was honored and I'm thrilled to have been asked to moderate the conversation. And it's an important one. It comes also on an important day um, that we should not forget. Um, and this is when everything started to change for Treasury. Everything changed for this country, um, but in particular, Everything changed for this department where one was working. The outlook for terrorist financing, its import, um, and, and really a tectonic shift in how many in our government looked at the tool chest that we had amassed in order to, to confront Al-Qaeda. And 
and how that threat would evolve and change is what is chronicled in this book, and in particular, uh, the tectonic shift that happened at the Treasury Department. And so with that, I would love to, to kind of start back, rewind the clock 12 years. Yeah. Um, you were at Treasury at the time of the September 11th attacks. I wonder if you could start off by just giving us a sense of those early days and when it became apparent to the people who were sitting in that building um, that there was going to be a, that they were going to have a role to play, that, yeah. that, that there was going to be something called financial warfare that was launched in response to these attacks. Rachel, before I answer the question, first of all, let me thank you for accepting the invitation and for doing this. Uh, you're a remarkable voice on, uh, even before you took your role on uh, Sunday edition, you, you've been phenomenal on national security issues, which is uh, you know, admirable, and I love listening to you on Sunday mornings. Um, and I just want to thank Dr. Hamry, uh, CSIS, Arnaud de Borshkrov, Tom Sanderson, uh, CSIS, and others for all their support. I would not have been able to do this book uh, or craft it without their help. Uh, the other thing I want to say is this is like a little bit of a reunion. Uh, there's a lot of you who are part of the community who were working on these issues before 9-11, certainly after 9-11, and it's a really an honor and a privilege that you've attended today, so I want to thank you for that. 9-11 um, really was a, a dramatic day, not only for the, the obvious reasons and the tragedy that we, we all experienced, uh, but it was a shift in how the government thought about the use of power. Um, and it was very clear uh, that President Bush not only articulated uh, that we were going to be at war with an enemy that had been at war with us and had brought that war to our shores in, Nor in New York and uh, Pennsylvania and in Washington, uh, but that also we had to think creatively and differently about the use of all elements of national power. And I think it's significant that the first uh, real step that the president took and the, uh, the U.S. government took was the signing of this executive order, uh, the exe executive order announced on September 24, 2001, that gave the Secretary of the Treasury enormous powers, um, powers that weren't necessarily new, but they were amplified. Uh, and in essence, opened the door to this new age of financial warfare. Uh, and what it do did was it empowered the Secretary of the Treasury and all the tools attendant to the Treasury Department, its regulatory functions, its sanctions capabilities, at the time its guns and badges, the law enforcement, uh, and the policy community uh, internationally, to start focusing on the isolation of Al Qaeda from the financial system, both formal and informal. Um, and that really opened the door for a new way of thinking about how to use Treasury's powers. Uh, at the time, we were very much focused on terrorist financing. I remember that day. Uh, I had just arrived at the Treasury Department three weeks before from the Department of Justice. Um, I was welcomed by folks like Danny Glazer, who's the current Assistant Secretary who's here with us, and others. Um, but I didn't really know what Treasury did, to be honest. Um, I came over to work on international money laundering and enforcement, but I, I didn't quite understand Treasury's role. Um, and I think that was emblematic of the government writ large. I don't think many people understood what Treasury could bring to bear. And the directive from the White House was uh, bring your powers to bear, figure out how to go after Al Qaeda's money, uh, isolate it internationally, build an international coalition, deepen the standards that you have on money laundering uh, to go after terrorist financing, and uh, do everything possible to not only stop the next attack, but to deter future funding of terrorist groups. And that really was the paradigm, as I call sort of the first part of the book, the foundation for a new approach to the use of Treasury and its powers. So that were, that, those were your marching orders. You started operating under something called the 80-20 <laughs> rule. Can you describe what that is and, and how it shaped what you were doing at the yeah. time? Well, the, the mandate at the time was to be aggressive, to be as aggressive as possible and as uh, uh, under the law as we could in terms of the use of these powers. And so Secretary O'Neill, the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, instituted what is in essence a management rule, the 80-20 rule, for purposes of using Treasury powers. And he said, we're not going to have paralysis by analysis. We're not going to do anything that's beyond the law. We're going we're to abide by the law, but we're going to be aggressive with what we can do. And that meant freezing assets aggressively, uh, which created some controversy because the use of asset freezing authorities are powerful. Uh, in essence, you throw a net around a network, uh, regardless of whether or not people are criminally liable, to freeze assets, to stop those funds from, in the future, going into the wrong hands. You only needed to be 80% sure. Yeah, and, and under the law, uh, you, the Secretary of the Treasury, under this power, only has to have a, a reasonable basis to believe that somebody is a terrorist or falls under the categories of the executive order. 
And that executive order, again, and folks like David Offhauser, who was general counsel at the time, were seminal in, in crafting it. Uh, that, that executive order allowed uh, the Secretary of the Treasury not only to go after terrorists, the bin Ladens of the world, but also those who were financially supporting or even associated with those who were financially supporting. So it opened up the potential for the use of the power and the directive was use it aggressively. Um, now the lawyers in the room uh, who were part of that process are probably screaming right now because there was no question it went through a battery of lawyers and checks and an interagency process uh, that was rigorous. Uh, but the mandate was use it aggressively, uh, let's touch some nerves uh, and do what we can. And we did, we did that. I lay out some of the sensitivities, for example, with the Saudi government in terms of looking at um, the sources of Wahhabi funding and how some of the charities that had been built up over time to not only do good works but also to support the Afghan Mujahideen were really, was really a problem. Um, and that led ultimately to the shutdown of the largest Saudi charity uh, in existence at the time. And as you say, there were innocent people who were swept up in this, who were found to be uh, culpable or, suspect or, or suspected of being culpable of some kind of financial misdeeds, who in the end were, were uh, proven that they were not involved. And you, and you write in the book that this is just the price of doing business at that time. A bit. It, it's, a, it's a price of the nature of this kind of authority and the, the fact that we were being preventative with the tool. That is to say, we were arresting assets, not people. We were trying to stop uh, bad money from going to nefarious groups and uh, plots. And that meant you had to stop the money. And it, if it was in the possession of people who weren't necessarily culpable or we didn't have necessarily proof of intent, um, that was OK, because that's not the standard. And that creates all sorts of friction. Uh, we had all sorts of debates internationally, particular with our European colleagues, about what those standards are. How should you use it? Uh, now, I think it's important to note, we used it judiciously. We knew how, the pow how important this power was, and we wanted to preserve it. And over time, that 80-20 rule grew to be a 100% rule. I mean, there, was, there were diplomatic costs to doing this wrong. There were legal co consequences if we, if we didn't get it right. And so uh, that rule shifted over time. But the, the baseline was we're going to be preventative and we're going to try to disrupt and dismantle financing that goes to terrorist groups. Another pivotal event. Um, comes through the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which stripped Treasury of some pretty, as you described, key authorities. Um, and it's interesting how you describe the effect on that department. Can you talk a little bit about what that did to morale and, and your sense of what your role was supposed to be in this new post-9-11 world? Well, one of the reasons I wanted to tell the story was because I think the history of that transition, the transition of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, is not well understood from the Treasury perspective, at least not outside of the, the halls of the Treasury Department. Um, and one of the dramatic things that happened was the stripping of what was then called the Treasury, of en uh, Treasury Enforcement Office. Uh, keep in mind, Treasury at the time had about 40% of federal law enforcement under its auspices the Customs Service, Secret Service, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. It was responsible for all federal law enforcement training. Um, Which I have to say, some who might not know this world might say, why in the world were those authorities ever under Treasury to begin with? Well, a lot of them were, grew up over uh, excise taxes. Secret Service, for example, was born out of a, a directive from Abraham Lincoln to go after the counterfeit rings that were bedeviling the country during the Civil War. Um, and so these were authorities that were sort of naturally treasury, but look like guns and badges. Mm -hmm. um, that often creates friction and did create friction with uh, the FBI, Department of Justice, and, and other agencies. Uh, but what happened when these bodies were stripped uh, and this, these functions were stripped from the treasury was a real fundamental question as to what is the Treasury Department? If 98% of its budget in this realm is gone, if it's most significant agencies like the Secret Service are stripped out. What is the Treasury and does it even have a seat at the table? Uh, and I recount in the book, there were times when I had to go and represent the Treasury and some of my colleagues did as well in interagency meetings over at the White House where literally the question would come up, people raising their hands saying, why is Treasury here? Why are they here? And the remarkable thing, Rachel, is that that question is never asked anymore. That the question instead is, where is Treasury? Why aren't they here? What do they have to bring to the table in terms of national security strategies? 
And I think, to me, that's the, the great success of that bureaucratic transition. Uh, and frankly, the magic of that period, which was we were so demoralized, very much sort of kicked in the gut. Um, but we reconceived recon what Treasury should be. Uh, and at, you know, if you look at all the key national security issues, Treasury is at the table uh, for each and every one of them without blinking an eye. And I want to talk about those specific evolutions. But when that person looked at you at the table and said, why is Treasury here? Did you have an answer in that moment? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and and we, we strategized around this. I mean, this, um, this was a small cabal. Uh, the original title for the book, by the way, was Gorillas in Gray Suits. And part of the reason I love that title, publisher, been a bestseller. publisher didn't, um, <laughs> but part of the reason I love that title was we were not only uh, engaged in a financial insurgency against our enemies, but we also had engaged in an insurgency bureaucratically within the U.S. government to survive. Um, and it was actually a very small group. Danny Glazer was one of them, Chip Ponce, Jeff Ross, a very core group of people. I was left with six people to help oversee uh, the, the elements of uh, the Treasury that were left behind. The Office of Foreign Assets Control, folks like Bob McBride and others that uh, handle sanctions, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, um, the criminal investigators from the IRS were still left behind. Um, but we, we actually strategized. We had a, sort of a come to Jesus moment to say, what are we? Do we even exist? Should we exist? And why? And the answer was, internally and to others, Treasury has unique powers authorities and relationships that can impact our enemies in ways that no other agency in government can. The FBI can't do what we can, the CIA can't, the Department of Homeland Security can't. We're the only ones that can touch the markets and the financial system in a way that forces the isolation of rogue financial activity. Treasury can do that with our powers and authorities and we set out to do that. So let's get into that and I'm, I'm going to quote from the book. You write that the 21st century financial and commercial environment had its own ecosystem that could be leveraged uniquely to American advantage. In this system, the banks were the prime movers. Simple as it was, this was strategic revelation. This strategic revelation was revolutionary. Where was the revolution and how did that manifest? The revolution was in two ways. I think the first was recognizing that this was an ecosystem, that the ability to isolate rogue actors uh, from a financial perspective was really about tending to the financial environment and uh, harnessing the fact that financial actors um, held as the coin of the realm their financial reputation and risk. And really that that in and of itself, that motivation was a core element of this ecosystem. And if we could impact it, we could actually impact um, how banks, non-bank financial institutions decided to do business with suspect actors, Iranian front companies, North Korean actors. So understanding that it was an ecosystem. The second revolution, I think, was the fact that we recognized that what mattered most was what those financial and commercial institutions decided in their boardrooms and in their compliance offices. Um, it became more important to us uh, the, how the CEOs of banks around the world reacted than how uh, foreign ministries were reacting. Because at the end of the day, it was the, the financial actors that were acting as the guardians of the gate of the financial system. They were the ones determining whether or not they were going to uh, open accounts, wire money, uh, issue liens, allow financial activity to go forward. Um, and if they weren't, people were blocked from the, the financial system. And it didn't matter what the UN said. It didn't matter what the finance ministry said. And in fact, one of, the, one of the things that we came up against, especially in the later years, with Stuart Levy driving much of this on Iran, was just the grave consternation that European countries had with the fact that we were meeting with their financial institutions and the financial institutions were taking steps that were further and beyond what the governments were both mandating and frankly wanted. Uh, but those banks were more concerned about their bottom line and their financial risk and their reputational risk than anything else. And I think, again, it was a simple proposition but what we did was we said, look, there's a strategy to actually impact this and impact it centrally. And so that's what we did. And I think that's why you've seen uh, th these financial pressure campaigns and, and other things work in ways that people hadn't even imagined uh, you know, just a few years ago. Let's walk through this a little bit. We're not talking about sanctions. You're talking about something different. You're talking about isolating and convincing those CEOs in the boardrooms that it is, it's not only immoral, it's just bad business. Right. To do, to do business with these rogue countries. Right. Sanctions are a core part of it. 
I don't want to dismiss sanctions because the way that uh, the U.S. Treasury has innovated and used targeted sanctions the way the European does this, very important and critical, the U.N. as well. But it's part of what I call financial suasion. You know, how do you impact the ecosystem in a way that actually organically rejects illicit financial activity? Um, and how can you prompt that system to reject it in a way where you align your national security interests with the financial interest? And so um, you're absolutely right. It's not just sanctions, and it's not just classic sanctions. It's the use of sanctions, enforcement mechanisms, regulations, laws, international standards, UN resolutions, um, uh, fines, everything in your toolkit to actually set the ecosystem and then to prompt it. And that was the, the trick. Um, and Treasury today, are, they're just masterful at it. They, they do this very well, um, and it's one of the great tools that I think the U.S. government brings to bear. Uh, and a tool that we've got to preserve in many ways. Um, it's, not all, it's not all perfect, as you yeah. write about in the book. There are several different case studies, most notably North Korea, which is a page turner of, of a section, if you're looking for the, that really good beach read. I recommend <laughs> North Korea. Um, but you write about shortcomings, how uh, Treasury's goals in this kind of isolation didn't always measure up with, line up with the goals of, of other agencies, yeah. other departments in, in the government. Can you talk a little bit about those shortcomings and, and how, you, how you navigate through those? Yeah. I think there's an inherent tension with um, these kinds of campaigns. And, and keep in mind that this is about uh, not just telling banks what to do, but it's about focusing on illicit conduct. It's often call, called conduct-based sanctions or conduct-based um, uh, activity that we're focused on. Um, and the, the point of this is it often is um, difficult to move the agenda from looking at some of the, those illicit activities and to mesh it, for example, with diplomatic goals. The North Korea example is a great example of why this is different than classic sanctions. The sanctions pre-9-11 were typically trade-based sanctions, commercial-based sanctions, driven by uh, diplomacy or what was happening at the UN. In the post-9-11 period, in the way we applied it against North Korea, um, what we did was to focus on North Korea's illicit financial activity. The Soprano State, uh, which deals in drug trafficking, money laundering, counterfeiting $100 bills, um, is engaged in illicit activity that is bad for business. And so we focused very much on that element of, of uh, the North Korea portfolio. The problem, though, Rachel, is there's a di divergence or, 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 a, or a juxtaposition between the interests of the diplomats to make a deal and to have uh, chips on the table to trade. And this kind of pressure, which is basically about cleansing and protecting the international financial system. And what you had in the North Korean example was uh, our ability to actually isolate the North Koreans in a way that they hadn't felt before. They told a senior White House uh, negotiator uh, in private, uh, you finally found a way of hurting us because we had isolated them from the banking system with one domestic regulatory act. The problem was it worked too well uh, and it got in the way of the six party talks and the diplomats wanted to unwind it and that grew very difficult because what we had tried to do was inoculate the system from doing business with North Korea and in the unwinding what we had to do was tell the financial system to do business with North Korea. And so it became a very tense uh, interagency process between the Treasury and the State Department. Uh, and also became a very difficult episode, I think, in our diplomacy because we gave away leverage, I think, too early uh, in the interactions with North Korea. Does that then undercut the effectiveness of these kinds of tools? And specifically, we're talking, um, we're talking about Section 311. Um, does that make it less effective if they are susceptible to, to politics, geopolitical interests, national security concerns, uh, and, and other interests of, of other U.S. government agencies? Um, I think so. I think that the, the danger here is that you have um, not only the potential overuse of these uh, powers, but you also have uh, the potential that there's a, uh, a divergence of interest uh, between the, the Treasury and the State Department, or even between the Treasury and other parts of the government, for example, uh, the CIA or the intelligence community, in terms of wanting to take action to actually isolate actors and the intelligence community wanting to, to sit back and watch and wait. Um, but absolutely, I think there's a, there's a potential tension there, and I think that's something that is yet to be resolved in the Iranian context, because we have President Rouhani talking about 
negotiations. And the question that he will raise and already has begun to raise is, um, how can the economy be improved? How can sanctions and pressure be lifted? The question on our end is, how do you unwind it? Uh, because the baseline of the, of the pressure we've put on Iran has been the baseline of suspect and illicit activity that the Iranians are engaged in. It's not because they're necessarily engaged in a nuclear program. It's because their activities are uh, potentially detrimental to the financial system. Uh, and so how you unwind that becomes a very tricky venture. And if the sense in the, in the banking community is that these are just political tools to be tossed around like diplomatic uh, chips, uh, then it really starts to lose its resonance and starts to lose its effectiveness globally. I want to get to questions, but before we do, I do want to ask you about Syria. It might be something other people pick up in questions, but um, you write about a Syrian case study applying this kind of financial warfare to a bank uh, used by the Assad regime. Um, I wonder, as you look at, at the situation now, where we are in this moment in Syria, do you look and, and see an obvious opp opportunity for some kind of financial pressure that would actually make a difference in, in a moment like this? I think it's difficult. And one of the points I try to make in the book is that these powers and these campaigns have been very successful. Um, and in a sense, they've been sort of uh, thought of as, uh, as the alternative to diplomacy and, and military power, and often seen as kind of maybe the silver bullet for some of these problems. And it's not, unfortunately. It, it's part of a set of tools and strategies to build leverage. Um, and so. I, I'm not Pollyannish enough to think that um, uh, you know, a, a more effective or aggressive financial campaign would actually stop what Assad's doing and the atrocities in Syria. That said, I do think you can build on what's been done. And, and to the Obama administration's credit, uh, it's done a fair bit on Syria. It, it, it hasn't risen to the level of attention like Iran and North Korea or even Al Qaeda, but it has garnered attention. And you've seen. Uh, the Treasury Department do some very creative things, uh, isolating another Syrian bank uh, just about a year ago, along with the Qataris, uh, which was a significant sort of move in terms of uh, coordination with Gulf-related countries, uh, trying to isolate actors and financial actors that are not only engaged in corruption, but also tied to Iranian support. And so that's very powerful because uh, the financial community doesn't want to deal with the Iranians, and it certainly doesn't now want to do with, deal with the Syrians. But I do think there's a, a moment for amplification, and this is probably it. Mm -hmm. um, and we just have to have the political will to say, look, we're, we're willing to take some risks um, in terms of our diplomacy and otherwise to go after Syria more aggressively on the financial front. I'll give you two examples. One is I think we should launch a preemptive asset hunt for, uh, for Assad, his regime, and his cronies. That is to say, traditionally, the way we've done asset hunts, the way I described we did the uh, Saddam Hussein asset hunt, uh, or even the, the Qaddafi um, freezing of assets that Stuart led, Levy led. Um, those have been sort of after the fact, post-revolution, post-fall of the regime. Why don't we do that now? We've declared the regime illegitimate. Uh, we've declared them corrupt. They're engaged in all sorts of atrocities now to include chemical weapons use. Um, so let's go after their assets now. Let's leverage the international system, all the actors in the space that actually go and hunt and look for those kinds of assets, and let's go find them and make it a concerted effort, and maybe you split elements of the Assad regime. The other thing is um, there are no doubt Russian banks who are assisting with uh, providing uh, financing for the weapons and other things that are going in, and perhaps a lifeline for Assad. Maybe we uh, do more than send a shot across the bow. Maybe we hit a Russian bank that serves as a nexus, and you send a very clear message to the Russians the Russian banking system, the banking system writ large, and to Assad that we're playing for keeps with respect to financial warfare. And so those are just a couple of examples where if we wanted to ratchet up the dial, we probably could. OK, with that, I know there are people in the audience who are perhaps even in the book. Now is your chance <laughs> Lots of to them. call out Zarate on what he got wrong. <laughs> um, I think we have a couple of microphones wandering around. Does anyone have a question? If not, we'll keep blathering on up here. Yes, sir. Right in the front. And if you don't mind waiting for the microphone. And introduce yourself, if you would. My name is Frank Barone, and I'm a private investor. So I'm on the, uh, you're effectively the tail that's wagging my dog. <laughs> so I would like to tell you a little bit of a story, and then I'll ask you a couple of pointed questions. Uh, I was in markets very heavily and very deeply for some 25 years, 
before the crisis began. Uh, I went through those markets with the crisis and felt indirectly at the third and fourth layer the effect of many of the things you're talking about. Most of us could not figure out what was going on, mm -hmm. but we knew something was going on. And usually when we reach that state in the financial community, we always look at the government as being the root cause. So we suspected you guys, <laughs> but we couldn't prove it. So now comes the question. At the core of all of this is the protection of the US dollars, the global reserve currency. <clears throat> if we lose that, it's game over. Now there's a lot of counterplays going on against you now. Uh, you know, what you did on wheat and sugar in Syria, which reveals what you just talked about, uh, has already tipped your hand. Uh, there's already some discussions going on between Saudi and between Qatar to do direct tradings for EUs on oil. Right. There's a lot of significant other alternatives that are weakening the dollar. Mm -hmm. I would ask you this. What's the Treasury Department's natural checkmate if, in fact, you do begin to damage the dollar as a reserve currency? Because that's game over. Yeah. Well, you, you raise a great point. I, I talk about this in the latter part of the, the book, the challenges to the, the power. and. Certainly, the challenge to the dollar is a central one. Um, uh, all the things that you, you've mentioned, also the, the use of the renminbi uh, for bartering and exchanges uh, more and more often. Um, so I, I, to answer your question, I think the check is, is the private sector. Uh, because in order for this power to work, the private sector has to be on side. You know, the question is, how do you build the legitimate systems where the private sector is on its own taking the right steps or prompted to take the right steps? Um, if, if the steps we're taking, and I talk about this as a tipping point potentially, is actually forcing uh, the good actors in the system to retreat from not only use of the dollar, but from uh, providing banking services or financial services in at-risk business lines or in at-risk jurisdictions, then our policy of exclusion from the financial system uh, is actually uh, being done damage to because we're losing the inclusion that allows that to, be, uh, to, to, to function. And so there's a very healthy but delicate balance between inclusion and exclusion in the financial system. And I think the bright minds at Treasury understand that. Uh, and so it's a matter of calibrating how hard we go and, and use these powers. Uh, but I think that the natural check is the private sector itself. And that's why these interactions between the private sector and the Treasury um, are so important. And frankly, one of the things that makes Treasury unique is that it has that dialogue with the finan financial community on a regular basis. And by the way, I'm no longer in government, so the, the we here is historical. Um, he says so I sit outside. <laughs> um, that does raise another question in this r related vein, and that is about the risks of over-designating. Can you talk a little bit about, because it, it is a balance. I mean, if, if every other day Treasury is throwing down some different designation on a bank that's, that's doing some nefarious business, uh, does it lose its power? Yeah, I think it potentially does. I think that these powers are best used when they're um, not only used on issues of national security import, but also in ways that are targeted and, and focused. Um, you do run the risk because these powers are so attractive, right? These, these are the powers that sit between diplomacy and war. And so, and people have seen that they're effective. And so p Congress, uh, administration officials, the executive want to use these powers. And they want to use them for everything. Uh, and I'll, I'll take a little bit of blame for this. I think some of us should, because what happened in the post 9-11 period was we adopted and adapted the terrorist financing paradigm, the foundation of this, and started to apply it in other areas, ones that were critically important, like counterproliferation or against tra transnational organized crime or looking at kleptocracy. And so, uh, you know, you've got to be careful how far you take it, because you do run the risk that it starts to blunt its effectiveness. And as I just said, starts to drive the private sector away from even wanting to do business in potentially risky uh, zones. And so, uh, again, it's an ecosystem. And so it has to be tended very carefully. And if you don't have some of these checks, you could, you could run the risk of overusing the authority or uh, affecting your ability to actually exclude from the market. And if you, you also raise the risk of, of allowing a space where other rogue actors, other financial institutions that aren't playing above board can come in and fill that space if, if the sanctioned bank. Yeah, and that's, a, that's one of the dangers. You've actually seen it. You've seen it in a couple of ways. But you've, it, in particular, and when I was at the White House, I was worried about this. Because you started to see 
um, the countries that were isolated starting to band together, a little bit like um, you know, the, the alliance of financial rogues, um, trying to help each other evade sanctions and create alternate ways of moving money. Um, and the trick there is, um, do they have the facilities to do that? Do they have outlets into the financial system? Venezuela uh, has done that historically now for the last few years for Iran, for example. Um, and so uh, you've seen this with uh, Belarus as well in certain cases. And so the question is, um, how can you continue to isolate actors without creating a shadow network or an alliance of financial rogues that actually serves to circumvent? And part of this is making sure the dollar is still central, making sure New York is strong as a banking center, uh, and that we are a central place for capital investment. And I think the fundamentals of America's economy uh, and its strength globally uh, is at the heart of why this power even works. The, the less powerful we are, the less our economy runs, the less the dollar is central, the weaker we are and the, uh, the, the, the harder it is to implement these strategies. Go to the audience again. Sir, third row back right here. If you don't mind waiting for the mic. Uh, thank you. My name's Olin Wethington. I thank you, uh, Juan, for your service for this book. Look forward to reading it. A uh, question, uh, could you make some comment, uh, please, on the state of cooperation of governments in other major uh, money centers, London, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo? How, how are we doing in bringing them into the kind of approach that uh, Treasury's put in place? Olin, thank you. And Olin did great work in Iraq uh, for the U.S. government and the U.S. Treasury. So uh, thank you for your service, Olin. Um, I think in, in, when you think about the sort of the international coalition that the Treasury built, uh, what's interesting about it was uh, we built coalitions along three lines. One, we did it with counterparts. And so the finance ministries and the central banks of the world actually became uh, very important actors in this space, uh, in, including in the financial intelligence space. Um, secondly, the banks themselves, as we've talked about. And third, the banking centers. And so certain countries like Switzerland or Liechtenstein or Luxembourg um, become more important in those kinds of alliances, right? It's, it's less about NATO and more about the banking centers. And so I think one of the successes of this period, and it's a constant challenge, is having the banking centers uh, sort of in line with U.S. interests and policies. And, you know, a lot of credit goes to uh, Treasury officials, John Taylor, uh, others who were involved in this space trying to ensure that uh, the, the major economies, the banking centers, were adopting the same standards, were applying and enforcing them, uh, and politically were on the same page as we started to isolate Iran, North Korea, and others. And so uh, I think that has gone relatively well. Where you have some friction, of course, and it's worth watching in the newspapers, is on the tax side. And I think um, tax treaties, uh, the treatment of, of tax transparency, has always been a point of friction between banking centers. Uh, and that's one that I think the US is trying to deal with uh, quite aggressively, and one that's going to continue to present some challenges between some of these uh, traditional banking centers. Ma'am. Sunny Efren with Human Rights First. Um, I welcomed your comments on the Russian banks and wanted to draw you out on that um, more. Um, specifically on the issue of how to deal with a frenemy like Russia. You know, last week we were in one place in the relationship, this week we're in a little bit of a different place. The two points that you raised about um, the preemptive search for Assad's money and the question of how to go after the Russian banks, I think are, you know, all, um, all of those strands converge on Russia and Russia's decision to continue to arm the rebels. And I wonder if you could talk about how uh, you would pursue that without running some of the hazards of um, having the tool politicized or tanking a major relationship or sending shockwaves through the financial system. Thank you. I, I think you have to do it delicately. Um, but the, the, historically, what the Treasury has done uh, has, to, has been to focus on conduct. Right? This isn't a political maneuver. It's one that um, relates to the sanctity and the protection of the financial system. And so in the North Korean context, for example, uh, we picked a bank that was a very bad bank, Banco Delta Asia in Macau, and we targeted it because it was facilitating North Korean activity. 
Now, we also targeted it because we knew it wouldn't necessarily upset the Chinese in the first instance, because the Chinese were banking with the North Koreans as well. But we knew it would send a very clear signal to the Chinese banks and markets. And so uh, I think finding the right example is important. You've seen uh, the Treasury do this recently. A couple of years ago, they designated a Chinese bank, Kunlun Bank, for doing business with the Iranians, uh, as well as an Iraqi bank. It was subsequently delisted. But the, the import here is you can pick the right bank as both uh, an example for the market and an example diplomatically without destroying the relationship. Um, and uh, I, I imagine there's probably a Russian bank or two that we could pick that would serve as a sacrificial lamb uh, in this effort and would really send some clear messages in Moscow and elsewhere. But we've got to be careful not to uh, over-politicize uh, its use. I'm going to go to the gentleman right here in the second row. We could get a microphone to him. Thank you, Juan. Uh, all this exercise started uh, after 9-11 because of a direct security threat. And what you have termed rogue players or actors have been directly uh, a source of threat to the security of the United States. Is there any perception of a threat to the national security out of corrupt governments that are not directly involved in any security threat to the United States, but a threat to the security of their people and therefore connected with the security of the United States? And are there any measures being considered to uh, address this issue? How do they affect the ecosystem? Yeah, no, Ziad, it's a great point. I, th I think the most dangerous thing to the ecosystem are state actors that, um, that amplify and enable non-state actors to access the financial system. And so uh, you see that in two ways, uh, Ziad. The first is where you have states like China that serve as outlets for those who are coming under financial pressure. Uh, in the book, I detail you know, how the Chinese and the North Koreans, through the trading companies, have largely evaded sanctions over the last uh, few years and developed protocols for doing so. Um, so you have kind of states that do that. You also have states that are involved in corruption. Moises Naim has talked about uh, the mafia states. Uh, and that's a real problem, where you have states that, are, that have direct ties with organized criminal groups and that purposely leverage the power of these non-state networks uh, to access the financial system, empower themselves, and enrich themselves. And what's so dangerous about the nation states is the nation states have access to lots of uh, not only protocols and laws, but facilities. And for example, one of the things the North Koreans have done traditionally is to use their embassies to courier money back and forth, to be able to deposit the super note, the counterfeit $100 bills. Um, and that's why you see the counterfeit note show up in places like Yemen and Peru and Taiwan. Um, and so it's when the, the nation state is mixed with these non-state actors to engage in profit making and illicit activity that you really have dangers not only to the ecosystem, but potentially to national security. Yes. Hi, Dan Wirtz from the National Committee on North Korea. Um, in the cases of financial sanctions on Iran and North Korea, there have both been some humanitarian consequences um, in Iran with difficulties getting medicine into the country. In North Korea, after the foreign trade bank sanctions earlier this year, uh, the UN agencies have had difficulties uh, getting money into the country to pay the bills. Is it possible for the Treasury Department or the US government to create channels for humanitarian aid in these cases uh, without disrupting the ecosystem um, that it wants to shape in accordance with national interests? It's a, it's a great question, uh, and it's certainly a challenge. I think sort of the maximalist use of this isolation in these campaigns um, can do some damage. Uh, and you've seen this not just in the examples you've given, but in remittance operations, uh, charitable uh, contributions. And so that's always a balance and, and a challenge. But sitting in front of you is, is a former counsel from OFAC, uh, Sean Thornton, who could uh, tell you chapter and verse as to how the Treasury Department actually issues regulations and licenses to allow for those kinds of humanitarian exemptions. And actually, one of the interesting things that you've seen the Treasury do, uh, and this goes to a more positive agenda in, in the financial warfare campaigns, <coughs> is to allow licenses for categories of exports or categories of financial dealings 
that actually allow for the kinds of goods and services to get into countries that we want. For example, uh, technology to get to opposition movements in places like Iran. Uh, that has been done fairly recently. The license has been granted, and so banks and exporters know that they can export then uh, perhaps with some danger, but can export uh, given the license that the Treasury's provided. So yes, there are the vehicles for that, and you've seen the Treasury Department use that strategically to affect some uh, key policy goals. Sir, in the back, he was quickest. Well, thanks a lot, Tuan, for an excellent book and for your service. Um, I just heard one question. Uh, I'm Amit Kumar from the Center for National Policy. Just, just one question on Section 311, which is quite a widely used tool now, and it's helpful in quarantining tainted accounts, transactions, jurisdictions, and, and financial institutions from the US financial system. But I think one of the drags is that other jurisdictions do not have a Section 311-like system. Uh, what can be done, or what is the Treasury doing in that regard to make other jurisdictions implement and execute and design something like Section 311? Thanks. Amit, thank you very much. And thank you for your scholarship on, on these issues, too. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, Rachel, especially with the President's speech last night um, and the debate about the United States as the indispensable, in, indispensable nation uh, and power, um, it's clear that that's the role that we played when we're talking about these financial campaigns. Um, it's not to say that other countries haven't done quite a bit, and it's not to say that other countries don't have initiatives and strategies, but it's often left to the US Treasury, it's often left, left to the US government to actually drive these strategies. Uh, now, the European Union has actually been fairly aggressive in recent years on things like Iran sanctions and Syrian sanctions, but even in their legal system, they're coming across difficulties with a number of Iranian banks, for example, uh, um, uh, challenging the listing in Europe and actually winning that challenge. Just recently. Uh, just recently. Uh, a number of Al-Qaeda financiers challenging and winning in the European system. And so there are challenges to the system uh, writ large. And I think at the end of the day, we still are the indispensable nation. And Treasury is the indispensable party in driving what happens in the ecosystem. Uh, and that requi requires clarity of policy. Uh, and good strategic thinking and great execution. Oh man, I think this gentleman right in the back had his hand up first. Hello, uh, Brendan Shields with CACI. Thanks for Brennan. spending a little time here. Um, I think if you <clears throat> went and walked down the street in any city and you asked an American to describe, you know, what do you think are instruments of national power? It might be a short list. They might say, well, military and State Department. I think it's great we can bring more attention to this and hopefully it gets a little bit more widely understood in DC and, and elsewhere. Um, two things, one, what other instruments of national power do you think can be brought better to focus to pursue our national interests? And two, as October's coming up, who do you think is the best shot at the World Series? <laughs> Thank you. Well, my angels are suffering this year, so I'm not gonna comment on the World Series. Uh, um, it's a great point, Brennan, because I think, it, you know, you listen to some of the great sort of national security professionals from the US, and they're, we're always bemoaning the fact that we don't have enough tools in the toolkit. Uh, this is something Madeleine Albright talks a lot about, she lectures about. Um, and in some ways, we've added to that toolkit here. And so I, I would hope with this book, at least people are aware, look, we've got a set of actors and actions we can take in this space that give us at least a complement to the types of things that we're, we're more aware of. But I think more interestingly, and this is, I think, a lesson of the use of this kind of power, in the 21st century, in a globalized world and economy, uh, it's often the non-state actors that have power and influence, right? We bemoan the fact that the US is not good at street craft as the Arab Spring has emerged. So what do we learn then? We learn actually what you can try to do at least is to leverage the power and influence of these non-state actors and networks for positive agendas. Uh, those that are in line with U.S. interests, and whether it's a human rights agenda or it's a financial integrity agenda or something else, there are actors out there that actually are in line with our interest. And I think the trick there in the 21st century is figuring out how you actually leverage that power. Um, and how do you create strategic suasion to complement financial suasion so that, so that people start to see that our diaspora community is an asset and a resource. Um, that the fact that we've got Americans who are helping to run the Somali transitional government is an asset. Uh, 
The fact that we have Pakistani business people uh, in the Fatah doing business is an asset. Uh, the fact that um, you know, social activists can draw out 11 million people using a Facebook campaign against terrorism, that's an asset. And so thinking differently about how we use power, and frankly the power of individuals themselves, I think is pretty important because we often get in this dichotomy of what Washington does, what the rest of America thinks. And I think 21st century is going to be more about what people power can do and what the super empowered individual can do, not just for nefarious purposes, as we've seen with terrorism, but on the positive side of the ledger. Uh, and I think, and I hope that's one of the lessons for what we've done over the last 12 years. Move to the front here, and then I'll get you in the back, sir, after this question. Thank you very much. One, um, uh, Tom Sanderson from CSI said, first like to say that I think I speak for everyone here in the front row that has been tremendously rewarding to work with you over the past few years. So thank you and congratulations on the book. Um, what you uh, were able to accomplish in your successors as well demonstrates that you're able to influence the formal banking system. Can you talk a little bit about the informal banking system, how difficult it is yeah. to impact things like the Hawala? Yeah. No, it's a great question, Tom, and I think one of, the, one of the great challenges, because I think the tools that we've talked about are most effective when you're talking about the formal financial system. Now, I think it's a little bit um, of, a, of a false paradigm to think of the informal sector and the formal sector and no ties in between. So one of the things I do in the book is try to explain what the Hawala Network is. Uh, the Hawala Network is this informal system of moving money across borders, basically a a brokering system, kind of like Western Union, but between trusted actors. Um, the interesting thing about these networks, Tom, is that they, they keep records. Uh, the brokers want to know where they've sent money, who owes them. Uh, so there's record keeping. They're on computers. Um, there are transfers. There are settlements between brokers using bank accounts. And so there are ties between the informal systems and the formal system. And even I was very critical, uh, for example, when talking about piracy, sort of using these tools against piracy and thinking, you know, what are we going to do, launch Danny Glazer in a parachute and go attach a Land Rover in Mogadishu? You know, what, what do we do? But the reality is, and as you've seen in your own research in, and uh, field work in Kenya, uh, that illicit trade and finance actually ultimately, if it reaches enough of a, a volume, starts to infect and impact the formal system. And so in places like Eastley, you have banking uh, centers built up around the financial networks of these pirate networks. And so at some point, the ligaments of the financial system interact and can be impacted. Uh, but that's not to say it's easy, um, and it's not to say that it can be done uh, as effectively, uh, but it, it can be effective. The other thing that's a challenge in here and talk about in the book is sort of the, the new technologies that are emerging. The bitcoins, the, the alternate currencies that not only impact the role of the dollar, but start to impact the, the ability of law enforcement to know who's behind transactions and how money laundering is operating. The FBI has put out a number of warnings about the use of Bitcoin by criminal groups. Um, and so we've got to watch the digital currency uh, space uh, for, for these purposes as well. One more question, gentlemen in the back. Yeah, I get to ask my question. Rich Davis from Artis. Juan, congratulations. Thank you, Rich. I'm going to put you on the spot policy-wise, assuming that you had a policy position today and we were considering the issue of uh, non-proliferation mm -hmm. or proliferation, uh, particularly around nuclear, chem, or bio, but recognizing that you have state actors and potentially non-state actors that are interested in, in pursuit of uh, proliferation, say nuclear. The, uh, what opportunities are there through the instruments of Treasury to be able to actually prevent uh, proliferation in, in countries that might be reactive to Iran, for example, whether it be Saudi Arabia or another. One caveat to the question would be to recognize that oftentimes you have nuclear power plants because they cost so much, for example, and oftentimes they're able to be used for plutonium or right. uh, enrichment, that because they cost so much, oftentimes they're syndicated loans that are actually used to pay for them. Are there any tools that can be used in, in that fight? A great and complicated question, Rich. Um, 
I think one of the huge challenges in this space, and it's not just in the financial space, but also with trade, is the problem of dual use items. Um, uh, and whether it's nuke or chem or even bio, you have the challenge of goods that are potentially being used for normal commercial purposes or, or, or nefarious purposes. Um, one of the things we did, Rich, uh, I think that was effective was we transplanted the paradigm on tariff financing um, on the issue of counterproliferation financing. And so now if you talk to the anti-money laundering uh, community, whether it's the compliance officers and banks or uh, the Financial Action Task Force, uh, you look at the standards, they are anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, counter-proliferation financing. And it's hard to say. Um, and so you've got the tools, you have standards set internationally. Um, the trick is, I think, in this space, politically, what you decide to do. Um, because I think there are sensitivities around these programs, uh, mixed uh, agendas in terms of uh, where they fall on the, uh, on the arena of priority. And I think given the situation with Syria, the, the whole question of chem weapons uh, precursor uh, proliferation is going to now fall to the top of the scale because people saying, with the New York Times reporting the other day, you know, why weren't we worried about this before? Clearly we were, but things like nuclear proliferation, terrorism, and other things uh, fall to the head of the line. And so I don't have an easy answer for you, but the system is set. So you can use sanctions, you can use uh, the financial pressure techniques that we've used all along to go more aggressively at the networks that, that matter. And frankly, I think if, I, you know, this is hard to say, but I think that's the kind of system you would have needed to go after, for example, the AQ Con network, which relied on financiers in Switzerland, suppliers in Malaysia, and the ability to ship to places like Libya uh, and, and elsewhere. And so, I think we've, we've created enough awareness and sy systemic attention that now you just need the political will to start going after these targets and networks of concern. But that takes political guidance and uh, strategy. Thank you. I think I will ask one more question. I will indulge as um, the moderator and as a way of giving you a chance to make some closing remarks. But you talk about the, the system, an ecosystem of bad banks and rogue actors, terrorist networks. Um, in the beginning, right after 9-11, there was a moral imperative. It wasn't a tough sell to get cooperation. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the evolution of that. Now, 12 years on, is that cooperation, which really is essential to what you describe as an organic kind of process mm -hmm. that has a sense of fragility to it, right. is that cooperation as forthcoming, how do you ensure that it is going forward? It's a great question, Rachel. Um, I'd answer it this way. I think the intensity of cooperation, uh, the sense of the day-to-day -day importance of counterterrorism work writ large, fades over time. That's human nature. I think that's natural. I think the interesting thing about these tools, financial campaigns, and, and focusing on illicit finance is that these are enduring issues that matter to the integrity of the financial system. And so, uh, money laundering mattered before 9-11, and it matters more so after 9-11. Financial crime mattered before, it matters even more so now. Um, I think the real question is how far you expand these powers, um, and whether or not you reach a tipping point where they start to be less effective over time, either because the U.S. has lost its predominance uh, as a central economy in the world, or the dollar has lost its pri uh, primacy in terms of currencies, or uh, because we've just overused it and people have stopped paying attention and these alliance of rogues have emerged. And so I don't think the attention has waned. I think um, the pressure is still there. People understand it, but it comes from different motivations. And that's in part what makes these tools uh, also unique. Well, with that, uh, the book is called Treasury's War, The Unleashing of a New Era of Financial Warfare. I think you can buy some copies outside. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to Dr. Hamry. Thank you to CSIS for hosting the event. Thank you to Juan. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. Thanks.